<laughs> All right, so last term, end of term A, right? First half, we went through units one through four where we covered unit one, atoms, right? What are the pieces of matter that we're talking about? Unit two, we started talking about naming compounds, combining atoms. Uh, actually, no, we started talking about the periodic table. Just kidding. Unit two was all about the periodic table. Understanding what patterns exist between atoms. Then unit three was about, okay, based off of those patterns, how do we combine atoms to build molecules, to build compounds? Intramolecular forces, T-R-A. Internal, strongest of the type of bondings, metallic, ionic, and covalent. And then unit four, we started talking about, okay, now that we've built the molecules, how do the molecules interact with each other? Because we know that we don't live in a world where we pluck one molecule at a time. We deal with thousands and millions of molecules all glumped together, okay? So the question is, how do those molecules interact? And that's where we left off with inter, between, okay? Molecular forces. London dispersion, weakest, everybody has it. Tripping bar of interaction. Next, dipole-dipole with permanently polar separation of charge, partial positive, partial negative molecules. And then three, hydrogen bonding, right? Not an actual bond, but like a bond, right? And we left off there and then you guys took a midterm. Okay, all of that, term A, was leading up to now the second half of content, which is unit five through nine, if we get lucky and finish on time, okay? And unit five is going to take all of your previous knowledge, units one through four, and put it together to explain chemical processes and reactions. So that is what unit five is about. And in order to um, get a bigger picture on what this looks like, all right, we're going to quickly introduce our new phenomenon which actually has to do with like kind of more ast uh, astronaut like space thing. It has to do with NASA um, to get us into thinking about, well, what is a chemical reaction? How do I know when that's happening? And then of course, what types exist out there? How do we quantify, right? The product that we make when we do a reaction. All right. So I'm going to have you guys watch this really quick background video. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about it. And I want you guys just to kind of listen the first time. It's only a minute and 18 seconds. I'm going to play it once for you. Just listen. The second time, I'm going to tell you specifically what to look for. All right? So no one needs to take any notes right now. We're just listening. Is there oxygen on Mars? Why is it coming? I can do it. Do aliens exist? That's a really interesting question and one that we have been trying to understand and explore and, and figure out for a really long time. We have not yet discovered life on any other planet. We haven't seen any scientifically supported evidence for extraterrestrial life. But if we think about life on this planet beyond the big things, the elephants, the whales, redwoods, and focus on the tiny things, nearly everywhere on Earth that we've looked, we found microbial life. And our definition of habitable continues to expand. Off the Earth, we've only begun to look. NASA has sent five rovers and four landers to the surface of Mars. In addition to that, our orbiters have been out fitted with some amazing cameras to take pictures of the whole surface of the planet, and we've only explored a tiny fraction of Mars. And that's only one of the promising bodies to look for life in our solar system. There are icy moons in the outer solar system, like Enceladus and Europa, that look like they may have subsurface oceans that could be habitable. And then that's just what's in our solar system. The more exoplanets we find around other stars, the more we learn about how many different environments could exist for life. So we can't yet say for sure whether or not aliens exist. But to quote Carl Sagan, the universe is a pretty big place. If it's just us, it seems like an awful waste of space. So we will keep looking. How oh, odd, um, lagging. Let's try this one more time and see if it will not lag. And let me see, stop it, stop it right now. Give me a second. Okay, so we're gonna watch this again now. And if you look on your notes, if you look on your notes, okay, 
Uh, what you have here is just some space. I want you to write down what is the phenomena, okay? And it's like the first question on the YouTube, okay? On the screen. And then what I want you to do is after you, as you're watching the video, I want you just to write a question that you have in general. Maybe it's even, what is a piece of information that you think you would need to answer this question, all right? And then we're gonna look into these equations here and we're gonna analyze them, all right? So we're just gonna watch it one more time, just a minute, 18 seconds, and hopefully it's not gonna lag this time, so it should be much better. Okay, so let's see if we can screen share massive and... Is there oxygen on Mars? Okay, just in case anyone's wondering, that is the phenomena that we're kind of gonna be looking at. Is there oxygen on Mars? All right. Okay. Yes, Mars has oxygen, but not very much, and definitely not enough for you to just go out and breathe on the surface of Mars. The density of the oxygen on Mars is about one ten thousandth of what we have here on Earth. But Mars' atmosphere does have a lot of carbon dioxide, about 500 times more CO2 than oxygen. So if we want to harvest oxygen on Mars for use by future explorers or launch systems, a better way might be to pull some of it out of the CO2 and use that instead. So that's where MOXIE comes in. MOXIE is a technology on NASA's Perseverance rover, and it has proven for the very first time that we can extract oxygen from the carbon dioxide in the Martian atmosphere. It's a tech demo, so it only produces a small amount of oxygen, but for future human exploration, we would need to send a scaled up version, maybe 200 times larger than the current MOXIE. So if such a system were landed on Mars, some of this would provide oxygen for the astronauts to breathe, but most of it would be used as rocket fuel to get astronauts off the surface of Mars and back to Earth. So is there oxygen on Mars? Not much, but that's okay, because we can make it ourselves. So that's funny, when I clicked on it the first time, a different video came up. Let's watch that one more time. Okay, question, is there oxygen on Mars? Yes, yes but not much. So we as scientists are developing, we have a problem, okay? How many of you guys have watched The Martian with Matt Damon? Really, that's it? Only three of you are cultured? Wow, thank you, four of you, five of you are cultured. Okay, first of all, Matt Damon, hello, not, not, not bad eye, not an eyesore, okay? Um, but it's a really interesting film that talks about the idea of, like we've all heard about the idea of like, maybe we could exist. What if we moved civilization to another planet, right? Because this one's in demise. So what if we just built out a new one, all right? Um, this is actually a really viable question for a lot of scientists nowadays as they consider the future of our planet and it's not looking super hot according to the data that we're given and the way that we're told to interpret. Um, and so there is this new problem, this new phenomena is can we, can we somehow multiply, synthesize, produce, okay, more oxygen on another planet? Could we somehow transform what was the abundant molecule that was present in a mass amount on Mars or that is currently present in a mass amount on Mars? Carbon what? It's a molecule. Carbon alone is an atom. Carbon what? Carbon dioxide are covalently bonded carbon with two dioxygens, right? Carbon dioxide. So what if there was a process that could transform one thing into another? Wouldn't that be dandy? Is there oxygen on Mars? Yes, Mars has oxygen, but not very much, and definitely not enough for you to just go out and breathe on the surface of Mars. The density of the oxygen on Mars is about one ten thousandth of what we have here on Earth. But Mars' atmosphere does have a lot of carbon dioxide, about 500 times more CO2 than oxygen. 
So if we want to harvest oxygen on Mars for use by future explorers or launch systems, a better way might be to pull some of it out of the CO2 and use that instead. So that's where MOXIE comes in. MOXIE is a technology on NASA's Perseverance rover, and it has proven for the very first time that we can extract oxygen from the carbon dioxide in the Martian atmosphere. It's a tech demo, so it only produces a small amount of oxygen, but for future human exploration, we would need to send a scaled up version, maybe 200 times larger than the current MOXIE. So if such a system were landed on Mars, some of this would provide oxygen for the astronauts to breathe, but most of it would be used as rocket propellant to get astronauts off the surface of Mars and back to Earth. So is there oxygen on Mars? Not much, but that's okay, because we can make it ourselves. Okay. So sorry for the rough intro to the videos. I don't know why the videos went to different sections, but let's switch back over to notes and let's look at what we have on our notes for a second. And let me get myself out of screen share. Stop share. Mm -hmm. Screen share. Broadcast, broadcast, there we are. All right. Okay, so <clears throat> we're told that our new phenomena is basically oxygen on Mars. And particularly, how are we making it? So if you do a little extra research, okay, on this process, you'll see that the MOXIE, the MOXIE is the instrument that we use. This is not the same MOXIE as our MOXIE Museum in Santa Barbara. This is not the same, okay? Um, but the MOXIE device actually goes through a two-part process where it, one, filters the carbon dioxide, and then once we purify that carbon dioxide, it uses the carbon dioxide and it decomposes it into oxygen and carbon monoxide. So there are two relative equations here. What I want you to start looking at is, this is an example, both of these are an example of a chemical process, okay? A chemical process that is different than a physical process alone. I want you guys to take about two minutes with someone near you and look at these equations and try to see what type of information or patterns you observe when looking at these equations. This is not the same as a math equation. You need to think about it differently. What should you be noticing? What is it telling you? Take two minutes to try to figure this out, go. Does anyone wanna tell me in word problem? version, like speaking out the compound name, what the first reaction is telling me? Like, how would you just read this reaction? Not even interpret it, just read it. Like very literally, what does it tell us? Two, what's the compound? Two lithium hydroxide, ionic or covalent. How do we know that? It's a polyatomic Paired with the metal, lithium. If you don't remember this, this is going to be a rough unit. You need to remember this. Okay. Lithium hydroxide, parentheses S. What do you guys think that parentheses S means? Solid. A physical state is being indicated here. So here we have two lithium hydroxide in the solid state, right? Combine with, what's the next thing? How many carbon dioxide? With one covalently bonded carbon dioxide with one carbon dioxide molecule. Is this, okay, uh, carbon dioxide, do you happen to remember the molecular geometry for carbon dioxide? Oh boy. Oh no. Yeah. Wait, no. Whoa! 
Molecular geometry, linear, it's double bonded to each oxygen on the other side. Y'all, this is all coming back. When I said chemistry builds, this is where it slaps you in the face. If you don't have an understanding in the previous units, you better get it fast. All right? Where with one carbon dioxide to produce. Okay? So two lithium hydroxide in the solid state combines with one carbon dioxide in the, what do you think the parentheses G stands for? If the parentheses S stands for solid. Gas. Yes. Yes. So a solid and a gas state molecule combine to produce, anyone want to try saying the name of the next one? Aislin. If I use mono di tri Greek prefixes, I'm a covalently bonded molecule. I can't figure it out any other way but being told. But we have here a metal plus a polyatomic. So do we need to say di tri? No, what do we assume you can figure out the subscript, the small number ratios with? The charges of the ions that they cancel out. So this is lithium, what? What's the compound name? Lithium carbonate, lithium carbonate, okay? To produce one lithium carbonate, okay? Solid and what? Water. How much water? Well, Carlos, one water, what state of matter? Data. One gas water molecule and one water gas molecule. Okay, so that's how you read it. Okay, couple things I want to point out that are super important. This chemical process involves physical, right? Very important physical transformations or combinations that we emphasize through parentheses, solid liquid gas, SLG. You also want to notice that we have a ratio either directly written or implicitly written. Do we really write ones very often in chemistry? No, not unless I'm asking you like formal charge honors, you definitely want to write the letter one, write the letter, the number one, okay? If I'm asking you to give me a ratio, then I ask you to write the number one. But if we're, you notice that usually we don't always write it. So when we're looking here, what we see is a combination of explicit and implicit ratios being revealed through big numbers in front of molecules. So that means we have a ratio of two to one to one to one. For every two lithium hydroxide, I, I need one carbon dioxide. For every one carbon dioxide, I make one lithium carbonate. For every one carbon dioxide, I make one water vapor. For every one water vapor, I need two lithium hydroxides. If you're at all starting to put this together, we're going to end up doing math with those very, very soon where we're going to quantify exactly how much we need of every single compound in a reaction based off the ratio of the chemical reaction equation. Danny, get your head off the table. You know, it's a pet peeve of mine. Okay, so this one, could you guys do what I did above and write out the word problem for the equation below for me? So who's the brave soul that's going to give me the reaction with the proper terminology and ratios revealed. Pally. That's a gas. Okay. To produce dioxide. Produces what? Dioxide. Ooh. Do you remember there was that really interesting term called Brinkelhoff where I told you there's a special group of seven elements that when you think they're alone, they're not. 
So what would we call this instead? Pure oxygen, okay? Produces pure oxygen in what state? Okay, and, uh-huh. One pure oxygen and one carbon monoxide in what state? Okay, excellent. Thank you, Hallie. So one carbon dioxide gas produces, or what another way we could put it as a sneak peek, it decomposes, it breaks apart into one pure oxygen gas molecule, which is by the way, a diatomic. Don't forget your Brinkelhoff, right? Okay gas molecule and one carbon monoxide gas molecule. So that's our intro to our new phenomena, our new exploration of unit five that is really an excuse for us to investigate chemical reactions. The ultimate task by the end of this unit is this, okay? Our ultimate task is our goal is to quantify and predict the amount of oxygen we can produce from a given amount of carbon dioxide. Okay, that's our ultimate goal, skill-wise, quantify and predict. That's the ultimate goal. And it's going to take us a week and a half to get there because it is a lot of math. And it is a lot of studying all types of chemical reactions out there. It's part of the prediction is knowing. Okay. Um, as a little forewarning, this unit is the lowest testing unit because it involves so much previous understanding Okay, my recommendation for you is that you start off this term very strong and that you put in a little extra effort this okay, unit because this is the one that brings your scores down the most and it sets the precedent for the rest of the term. It's very hard. It takes a lot of work to pick it back up. Okay, so I'm just giving you the forewarning now that this is the unit you're really going to want to pour time and energy into to get you started off well, okay? So that's our phenomena. Let's back it up and start with how do we even begin getting to this point of being able to quantify and predict? Well, let's figure out how we can even tell it's a chemical versus a physical process, all right? So a physical change alters physical characteristics only. So for example, a change in state of matter is a physical process. Now we saw different states of matter in the equations above, but it wasn't alone. It wasn't like that was the only thing that was changing, okay? Another example is you can change amount, right? Size, I could cut off your pinky toe, you're smaller. That wasn't a chemical change, that was a physical change, okay? a little um, thought back to Into the Woods, cutting off the toes and the heels. Um, color change, right? Sometimes that's indicative. It indicates a chemical change, but sometimes you just change the color. It's like if I just suddenly dye your shirt blue, it's still the same material, it's just blue, okay? But a chemical change, on the other hand, involves the production or the creation of a new substance, i.e. you have bond breaking and new bond forming. You literally rearrange the atoms and how they partner up, okay? Bond breaking and new bond forming.
So some examples, okay, cooking. Every time you cook with heat, you are doing a chemical reaction, okay? Um, another example is uh, anytime you see, let's see, what's the often, what's the common transformation that you guys encounter in every day? I mean, a lot of you guys don't realize how much chemistry. Oh, well, biochemically speaking, your bodies are full of, okay, your metabolism. How do you think you get nutrition from your food? You do a ton of chemical reactions inside your body. Like eating a cow doesn't actually just go straight to energy. Like some, that hunk of meat doesn't, isn't just like energy itself. It's the transformation of that meat, particularly the protein, okay? And the fats from, if you get a fatty piece of meat that are transformed into ATP and so forth molecules that actually can be used by your body, right? So uh, quickly with uh, just someone around you or by yourself, identify each of these as physical or chemical processes. So we're just gonna shout it out. Say C or P. One, ice melting. Two, toast burning. C, that is a new substance. That ash burned Toast, that's a new thing. That is a new compound. Sawing wood. Metal rusting. C, evaporating puddle. Have you guys seen Frozen when he's like talking about summer? He's like, yeah. I always think of that when I see that. Candle burning. C, anytime you light a candle in your home, you are lighting a open system chemical reaction. Whew. Okay, so here's the thing that you're probably noticing. A lot of physical changes go with chemical changes. Absolutely. If you're a new substance, you tend to take on new physical properties. So what we're going to see is that we actually often identify that a chemical reaction has occurred through significant physical change. But don't forget, not every physical change means there was a chemical reaction, but chemical reactions can be identified and always include a physical change, okay? So let's kind of talk about some of these. And by the way, tip to yourself, you might want to memorize this because this totally might be a question on an upcoming quiz, okay? So... Evidence of a chemical reaction or a chemical change, right? A chemical process, reaction, change. There's a lot of ways you can say it. Include temperature change. Okay. When things get hotter or colder, okay? When things release heat or absorb heat, that's often an indicator that something chemically was rearranged. Bonds were broken. New bonds were formed. Atoms partnered up with different atoms. Two, a precipitate is formed. A precipitate is a fancy word for a solid substance form. We often say that the solution, S-O-L-N for shorthand, gets cloudy. You're like, why does it look milky all of a sudden? It wasn't like that before. You should be very concerned, by the way, if that's what like drinks look like, don't drink that, okay? Um, Another thing is that, of course, you have, um, oh, I don't know, oh, color change. Sometimes what you'll see is that when you mix two things together, they take on a new color and they become cloudy. That tends to go together often in the type of reactions that we'll be studying. Um, but a color change is some pretty indicative when there's a mixture involved. Now, if you're just putting red dye in there, like, okay, okay, that does not count. Okay, but if you mix two substances that were clear and they suddenly become bright pink, you're like, oh, I wonder if something happened. Probably. Okay, uh, heat given off is a really good indicator. Heat or, I don't know, fire, right? The spontaneous combustion of, magne of magnesium with water is a really good indicator when it kind of created its own flame from last term. 
that there were probably that looks like five. I understand that now. I I see why you all look confused. Um, it's probably a really good indicator that there was a chemical reaction occurring because an immense amount of heat was released, showing an immense amount of energetic transformation. Okay, um, gas formation. If you start seeing things bubble or vape or vapor come off, one, you probably run. Um, but two, because oftentimes that vapor is highly combustible. So just putting that out there or, or it's going to knock you out. Uh, but two, that's a really good indicator that a new substance has been made because if you think about it, a gas can only be made if atoms rearrange because it wasn't there before. So it had to be a new thing, okay? And then finally, the biggest one is a new substance is made, which honestly is really hard to know unless I tell you what the chemical reaction is, okay? And then sometimes odor, like if you smell something and it's not there anymore, that means that probably new compounds are made. Or if you didn't smell something before and now you smell something, that's also a really good indicator that something has been made. Any, by the way, just like a fun fact, I used to work with a molecule known as pyridine. God, I hope I remember this correct. Pyridine, um, this molecule, and it had like an H attached to it. Uh, this can temporarily sterilize men. Uh, it's highly vaporous and it has the worst smell thing, smelling odor. Anytime you have a sulfur containing or a nitrogen containing ring compound where it's like connected and enclosed, you often get terrible smells. So your farts, sulfur based, okay? That's why you get a really bad odor. Um, so just like a little fun fact. Um, physical changes do not always indicate do not always indicate who was listening. Chemical, okay? But a chemical change always has physical changes, okay? So um, I don't know why I said this is the end of class because we got one more activity to do. So I don't know what I was thinking. I'm gonna move this down here. Um, so, that's the overview of chemical versus physical. That's kind of all I really want to introduce with that. And now let's start getting into, okay, now how do we write these chemical changes? How do we model? Ooh. Ooh. How do we model, right? Because mathematical equations are really just a fancy model that's less pretty, okay? There are a lot more textbooky model of things. So what you guys are going to do is you're going to play a game. Okay, and you're going to play the game known uh, a FET simulation game where you're going to look at chemical equations and you're going to figure out how do we write these and they have to do something with the large numbers in front. Like, why do I even need those numbers? How do I figure those out? And your goal is to get five stars on all three levels of the game mode for this FET simulation. And then you're going to tell me what patterns do you notice? What is the trick behind figuring out the game? Okay, so you guys have about 10 minutes to do this. And then we're going to talk about this as a class. So go ahead and open up this FET simulation and try this out. Drea, tell us, what patterns did you notice that got you to win? What was it? How'd you win? What was, what was winning? What does that mean? Did you do yoga? Did you do yoga? Is that what you mean by balancing? Okay, tell me what it means. What does it mean to be balanced? What indicates it? How do you win something, but you don't know how to win it? Anyone else want to give me their identification of how you win the game? You're the game rider. What's the ultimate goal, Min? Um, you try to balance all the... You guys keep on using this word balancing. You don't even know what that means. Tell me what it means. No, because balance sounds like yoga. Balance sounds like I'm a life coach. What does balancing mean here? Yes. 
Input equals output. You're getting closer. I am a non-chemistry, non-English speaker. I'm mute. Let's say I'm mute. What would you show me? Okay, anyone know American Sign Language? What would you show me visually that actually indicates to me how I win the game? Like, what is the goal? Carlos. You need the least amount of pairs and you need two to cancel out. You're thinking of a very specific equation, but what about all three? All three levels have different equations. Does that apply to every single one? There is something that wins you every single time, no matter the equation. How do you know that you're balanced? What does that really mean? Cancel, am I getting rid of anything? No, like they, they, they have what? Say that one more time. Okay. Could you make it more succinct? Can you do it? Can you do it on the right side? Yeah, that'd be equal to that. What is the amount? The amounts of what? Itself? The amounts of what? Okay. So the amounts of each atom or element have to be equal. Could you make that even cleaner for me, Mary? Excellent, excellent. Everybody look at me for a second. Stop talking for a second. Your iPad is, I don't even know what you're doing right now, but just look up here for a second, okay? What does it mean to balance? It means that, thankfully for the cumulative effort of several people in front, it means that the number of each type of atom is equal on the left and the right side. Another way of putting it is the reactant and the product side. So the number of each type of atom is equal. That means if I start with two, okay, and pinks and three, or sorry, four purples on the left, I need to end up with two pinks and four purples, maybe rearranged differently, okay, but nevertheless still there. And how do I indicate that? How does that get revealed in my chemical reaction? What is used to show that it has been what we call balanced? Yes, Aislinn. Um, yeah. The, what do we use to show that it's been balanced? We use, okay, what we call coefficients or the large numbers. So what would be the rules of the game? Oh, you need to Balance your chemical reaction by what? By making sure you have the same number of each type of atom on the reactant left side and the product right side. How do I get that achieved? What's actually shown in my equation? How do I reflect that? Oh, okay. What do I tally up? My coefficient, my big number in front. Right? Because if you look up here at the beginning, you should have noticed something. This equation, you should have immediately noticed there was a problem. This is unbalanced. Because I have two oxygens and one carbon decomposing into three oxygens and one carbon. Where'd that other oxygen come from? 
What do you have to do? You'd have to add coefficient to make it make sense, okay? Because it's like when you cook, okay? When you're making a brownie mix and you add the two eggs and the like quarter pound of butter and the tablespoon of oil, that's all still there in your brownie later. It's why you have calories in brownies and a lot of it. It doesn't suddenly dissipate, okay? You don't suddenly lose that oil to the oven and now your oven's all shiny and clean. Like, no, that's not how it works. It's all there. It's just rearranged. The same is true for this, okay? Um, when I ask you guys to play a game, okay, and to tell patterns, don't forget one of the biggest skills in chemistry that wins you people Nobel Prizes is literally their ability to observe and articulate that observation, all right? So this process right here is where we're going to pick up tomorrow in balancing reactions. We're going to start with figuring out how do we write reactions well, and then we're going to balance them. And we're going to learn the formatting and the coding. All right. Uh, but that is all for today. So good work getting back into it, you guys. I know it's a rough start always.